morning. Welcome back to day two of Lumina Foundation State Policy Retreat. I'm Amanda De La Rosa, Strategy Officer for State Policy at Lumina, and I get to serve as our retreat MC this year. If you were one of 750 registrants or 20 state teams with us yesterday, you heard loud and clear from Lumina's executive leadership that we are acutely focused on advancing racial equity and justice under our new strategic plan. Our leadership team spelled out what's at stake as our public health crisis deepens social and economic inequities between our Black, Latinx, and Native American communities, and as systemic racism persists, rooting out opportunity for all. As a leader in your state, and as a part of our Lumina family, your resilience in uplifting and acting on policy solutions that meet the needs of today's learners could not be more important. If you were with us yesterday, you also stuck with us through a few tech hiccups that seem to find us everywhere we go in our new virtual reality. Thank you for your patience and your grief. Before we dive into this morning's thought-provoking content, I'd like to remind you to engage with us on social media, tagging at LuminaFound and using the hashtag SparkAShift. At any point, you're also welcome to explore the Expo tab which houses on-demand short policy spotlights. Up next, you'll, you will hear from leaders in three states who have started on the journey of engendering more equitable talent development systems. Governor Brown from Oregon, Governor Holcomb from Indiana, and Governor Northam from Virginia reflect on why their commitment matters in their states red and blue. Then our own fearless leader on the public policy and states team Senior Vice President and Chief Policy Officer, not to mention Lumina's most famous Howard alum, Dr. Danette Howard, will facilitate a discussion with the SHEOs from those seats on how they're putting their governor's visions into action. After that, Dr. Courtney Brown, Lumina's Vice President for Impact and Planning, will discuss an OECD study on labor market relevance and higher ed outcomes with four state leaders. You'll be viewing an excerpt of that conversation and can access the full recording in the expo. If you're joining us as a team member from a state, stay tuned at the end of those sessions for instructions on what's to come for the rest of the day. Now it's my honor to turn it over to the leaders of three great states. First, thank you to the Lumina Foundation for having me here today to participate in your fall retreat. I know so many of you are doing great work across the country to address disparities in higher education. And I hope in the future, when physical distancing is not a daily necessity, to meet and work with more of you in person. As you know, racism and racial disparities impact every part of our culture and our economy. Oregon has experienced a historic wildfire season and a global pandemic that have further impacted Black, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Pacific Islander, and communities of color at disproportionate rates. And as we saw across the country this summer, thousands of Oregonians took to the streets peacefully to make their voices heard, issuing a clarion call for racial justice and police accountability. Some of the most important issues that Oregonians face, economic opportunity, criminal justice reform, police accountability, health equity, climate change, housing, homelessness, and yes, education are inextricably tied to race. Racism and racial disparities impact every part of our culture, our economy, our systems and institutions. And the pandemic has further exacerbated these disparities. People are co of color are less likely to have the income or savings that make it easy to stay home from work. People of color are more likely to have frontline jobs during the pandemic, working in hospitals, agriculture and food processing, childcare, grocery stores, and of course, home health care. People of color are less likely to have access to high quality health care coverage. People of color are less likely to have access to the devices and high-speed broadband connections necessary for distance learning. You all know the list goes on and on. 
for far too long, Oregon's Black, Indigenous, people of color, and tribal members haven't had a seat at the table. But as Shirley Chisholm once said, if they don't offer you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I think in Oregon, we can do much better than that. So we're embarking on a process to build an Oregon that works for all of us, not just some of us. An Oregon where we can all be respected and valued. And as we work to reshape our state budget, we must support the communities currently experiencing crisis. We must ensure a better future by focusing necessary recovery measures around racial equity and inclusion. One thing is very clear to me on the subject of racial justice. Words are not enough. Actions matter. I count myself as one of the many white leaders whose good intentions haven't done enough to address systemic racism. And it's long past time we take decisive action here in the great state of Oregon. The institution of racism won't be dismantled in one day, but I know we can dismantle it the same way that it was built, brick by brick. That's why in Oregon, we're starting to change the conversation in the rooms where budgets, investments, and policy agendas are created and developed. This year, I convened a racial justice council that includes representatives from diverse backgrounds, explicitly centering Black, Indigenous, people of color, and tribal voices. The council is currently developing recommendations on how we can dismantle the structures of racism that have created grave disparities in virtually all of our social systems and structures, including educational attainment. I want to emphasize that the Racial Justice Council is more than a forum for conversation. The council is in the process of providing specific recommendations to inform my 2021-23 recommended budget and legislative agenda that will center racial equity. After generations of exclusion and racist policies, we plan to build the state back better than it's ever been. Racial equity isn't some trendy icing on the cake. Instead, it must be considered a crucial ingredient that's baked in from the beginning at every single layer. Changing our thinking will shape the future of Oregon for generations to come and create a future where everyone has the chance to thrive. This much is clear. Our budgets, policy agenda, and priorities should reflect, support, and honor the communities who have been most deeply impacted by systemic racism. With that focus, we will be able to build a safer, stronger, and more resilient Oregon for everyone. We know that setting students up for success in higher education has roots all the way back to preschool. That's why Oregon is investing in early childhood education and K through 12 education through our Student Success Act. Addressing educational disparities for students from historically underserved communities will help to ensure that more students of all backgrounds and income levels are able to pursue opportunities in higher education. We also know that students need teachers who not only open doors for them, but who reflect their experiences. That's why Oregon has worked tirelessly to diversify our teaching workforce. And we know that students of color with access to career and technical education courses are more likely to attend class and much more likely to graduate and be ready for what comes next, which is why we've also worked to expand access to career technical education programs. I'm also really proud of the state's adoption of a funding formula for our public universities that is weighted to improve outcomes and opportunities for students of color and underrepresented students as well as to ensure that our undocumented students fully qualify for state financial aid through the Oregon Opportunity Grant and the Oregon Promise, two programs that specifically work with post-secondary students of color. We've been striving to ensure that these students end up with more grants than loans. I'm happy to report that today, more than twice as many students of color 
earn degrees at our public universities than 10 years ago. While the number of white students earning degrees has stayed relatively constant, it's encouraging when the data shows we're taking steps in the right direction. Looking ahead, we need to strengthen the state's commitment to financial aid and reform existing aid programs to focus our dollars on our highest need students. We're also working to transform our institutions to become better at representing and serving students from communities of color. And we are strengthening transfer pathways to reflect the fact that for today's students, and especially for our students of color, the route to a degree likely involves more than one college or university. And as it has with many other aspects of our society and government systems, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and exacerbated many of the historic disparities and inequities already present in our higher education system. I'm committed to doing the hard work to address those disparities, and I know all of you here today are as well. Thank you again for everything that all of you are doing to increase opportunities in higher education. This year has made it more clear than ever that we are truly all in this together. And I know that through our collective efforts, we can achieve real change as we work toward racial equity for our students. Thank you. Our country is unique and that we were founded on the promise that all men were created equal. As our founders wrote, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet it's just a fact. The concept wasn't put into practice even before the ink was dry. Think about it. It took 100 years after the Civil War to finally pass laws that outlaw discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, and prohibited racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. Now for sure, there has been undeniable progress. We've seen people of color move into positions long denied them in business, including America's first female self-made millionaire Indiana's own, Madam C.J. Walker, and in education, and in sports, and in the arts, and in government, including the election and re-election of a black president. And yet today, in 2020, it's clear. We must aspire to do more to form that more perfect union. So I've spent considerable time since Mr. Floyd's death connecting with and listening to black leaders and stakeholders. One conversation leading to the next and to the next and to the next. I've talked with and listened to mom and pop business owners, college presidents, law enforcement, corporate executives, church leaders, and everyday citizens, rural, urban, and suburban. Many have shared what's on their hearts and minds, and I've tried to do the exact same. One theme I heard over and over again was the importance of getting to root causes of inequities and not just reacting to the symptoms. Dr. Huddleston said we must remove barriers to success so all can benefit and achieve their dreams without having to worry about how much privilege society has afforded them. I called my entire cabinet together and shared my commitment to acknowledge past shortcomings and do something about it, no matter how hard or raw or uncomfortable it might be. We formed an executive branch task force and charged them with identifying gaps in state government and providing recommendations to address them. And so for my first action, I'm creating a new position, Indiana's first ever Chief Equity, Inclusion, and Opportunity Officer. This person will be a member of the Governor's Cabinet, 
reporting directly to me and will immediately focus solely on improving equity, inclusion, and opportunity across all state government operations, as well as drive systemic change to remove hurdles in the government workplace and the services we provide. And second, help them deliver their own strategic plans to tactically remove all such barriers. In short, this cabinet member will help every state agency raise their game. but there's more to be done. To truly empower marginalized Hoosiers, we must aggressively, aggressively close education and workforce training gaps. I believe that the surest path to equal opportunity in life is with a high quality education. Indiana's new Secretary of Education come January must make it a priority to improve minority teacher recruitment and learning gaps to bridge the divide between the haves and the have nots. No task will go farther toward promoting equal economic opportunity throughout Indiana than a good education. That's why I've made developing our workforce a top priority. It's a passion. And that's why the state of Indiana will pay 100% to skill up Hoosiers to fill the current 118,000 job openings we have right now in our state. Our next level jobs program, which helps Hoosiers get training and helps employers train them, has been by most measures an overwhelming success. Just ask all those lives who have already been changed for the better because of this program. That's why we just added another $50 million from the CARES Act to these high wage, high demand programs. However, we must recruit more minorities into these fields and assist more minority owned businesses to take advantage of our state programs. It's there waiting to be used. I've asked Indiana's Commissioner of Higher Education, Teresa Lovers, to work with DWD Director Fred Payne and our Workforce Cabinet to submit specific recommendations on how we might adjust policies for all our workforce programs in order to create greater opportunity for people of color. Truly leveling the playing field will require all of us from every corner of society. I commit to you that I will work to be a barrier buster and to bring greater equity and opportunity within your state government and the services you entrust us to provide so that every Hoosier can take full advantage of their gifts and of their potential. And together we'll make e pluribus unum out of many one, not just a slogan in any but our North Star. Well, Governor, thank you very much for joining us for our state policy retreat. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for, for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. And I, I really appreciate the, the relationship that the Commonwealth of Virginia has had with, with Lumina uh, over the years. And, uh, I know your your viewers are, are well aware of the, of the participation, the, the grant that we received last year of $500,000 and then this year uh, over $700,000. And, and that will be used for, for six of our public colleges and universities to, to really emphasize um, the importance of equity uh, and access to quality education for, for all Virginians. So we appreciate our relationship with you. Well, thank you. And likewise, we've really enjoyed our partnership. Um, our work is driven by states being the key driver of what we see as the, uh, the imperative to increase high quality post-secondary educational attainment. And we're very proud to be working with you in Virginia. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about this intersection of your, of your uh, great interest in racial equity and, and justice with how you're thinking about uh, developing the workforce in Virginia and how you think that might 
uh, be strengthened by the kind of investments you've made? Well, you know, we've, as I said, Jamie, we've been working on equity issues uh, during our administration. Uh, obviously, we had had our incident back in in uh, February of, of 2019. Uh, I've been able to travel around Virginia. I've listened to uh, wonderful people. I've, I've learned a lot. And as, as we say, the more we know, the more I know, uh, the more we can do. And so one of the first things uh, that, that I did, um, you know, we, we have over 100,000 uh, state employees and we did not have an officer of equity, inclusion and diversity. And so uh, we did a job search and we have a wonderful person, Dr. Janice Underwood. We're the first state in the country to, to have that position. And she has really hit the ground running um, regarding education, regarding access to health care. Uh, we have an African-American advisory board uh, that I'll actually be meeting with later today. Uh, they're providing wonderful uh, recommendations of how we can move forward as a, as a commonwealth. Another thing that I found very interesting, Jamie, in, 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 in listening to people, and that is the education. What are we teaching our children uh, regarding race? Um, and I have found uh, that it's inaccurate. It's also inadequate. So we put together a commission uh, to address that issue, to look at, you know, what's in our textbooks, who's doing the teaching, what are they teaching? And so, so we're really trying to come at the equity issue, the, the, the racial injustices from a lot of different angles. And, and as I said earlier, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but I, I think we're making really good progress in a lot of different areas. Um, and if Virginia is going to continue to be strong, if Virginia is going to continue to be the number one state in which to do business, the number one state for workers, we've got to really make education and access to education for everybody a top priority. And that's what I intend to do as long as I'm sitting in this seat. Yeah, and I think that's a fantastic commitment. And the examples that you've used, I think, uh, really demonstrate that. You know, this, this convening includes um, state policy leaders from around the country who are focused on, on higher education and post high school learning issues. Um, creating that cabinet level <clears throat> position that you mentioned, Dr. Underwood's position, I think is extraordinary. You've shown great leadership with that. Do you have any advice for the people in other states about uh, sort of developing that kind of cabinet level position and positioning it for success in, in this kind of an environment? It seems like states are ready to take the next step, but you were the one that took the first step. What advice would you have for them on, on creating that kind of a position? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, Janice, to her credit, came in and, and really had to build this position. And it is a, a cabinet level position from the ground up. And, and she started, um, and she's a wonderful listener, and she reached out to our other cabinet secretaries. We have 15 uh, and talked to them about the importance of, of equity and, you know, and, and what they were doing to address that, whether it be in agriculture or education, health, uh, our, our commerce. And so, so she did a great job listening, and then she has just expanded uh, from there. But uh, my advice would be to, uh, to find a good person and then support that person um, and then surround them with, with good people as well. And so that's what we've tried to do. And she's done an amazing job so far. I think that's terrific advice for, for our participants, and I'm sure they're going to be glad to, to get that, that counsel. I wanted to ask you about something you mentioned a, a few minutes ago, which is that you've, you've really tried to prioritize uh, funding when it comes to these issues of racial equity and justice. Um, you've worked to increase funding for your historically black colleges and universities. You've also uh, done things like supported in-state tuition for undocumented, undocumented Virginians. How, you, how have you been able to do this from a policy and political perspective. These are challenging conversations. States are facing enormous um, budget challenges really exacerbated because of the pandemic, of course. How have you been able to, to put that in place? To us at Lumina, it seems like a model for what we would want to see other states doing, but we also recognize that there are many competing priorities in state budgets. And, and so how have you been able to make this a priority for, for Virginia? It's a great question. I'll, I'll just start by saying that uh, in March of this year, we had one of the most progressive budgets that Virginia has ever seen. And a lot of resources uh, that went into higher education, went into our community colleges, our historically black colleges and universities, 
K through 12, early childhood education. And Virginia, just like probably all other states, had to hit the pause button. Um, you know, we're in the middle of both a health crisis and an economic crisis. Um, and so I have encouraged everybody that you know, we've got to be cautious moving forward. There are a lot of unknowns with this pandemic, but let's not veer away from our priorities. And so, you know, we will uh, look at our, our budget uh, again next month, um, and then we'll start session in, in January. Uh, but we need to continue to to prioritize uh, education. And so uh, regarding things like our historically black colleges and universities, uh, we actually will continue to, to fund them. And you know, one thing that's important to remember, Jamie, it's, um, it's these are the backbone of our education system and they have been underfunded for years. And so uh, it's time to, what I would say, put our, our money where our mouth is and, and make sure that they continue to be strong and, and viable because they, they contribute so much to, to higher education. The other thing that is very important uh, is supporting small businesses and especially minority owned businesses. And, and they, uh, like every other business, have, have been hit by this pandemic. So, so we have a, a program called Rebuild Virginia uh, where we're reaching out. Uh, we started with $50 million. We're reaching out to to small businesses, especially minority owned businesses with, with grant money to, to make sure that their businesses can continue. And then the last thing I would say in regard to that is small businesses are about 90%, 97% of our economy. They're literally the backbone of our economy. So, so we wanna make sure that, that we promote uh, individuals that wanna be entrepreneurs teach them how to get capital, teach them how to start a small business. Because as a small business owner myself, that's a very daunting task. And, and I think it's fair to say that when we talk about inequities, um, there's a tremendous inequity uh, when you talk about access to capital and starting a business for people of color. And that's something that it's, uh, we all should find is unacceptable uh, and do whatever we can to remedy that as we move forward. You know, you, uh, you're mentioning this issue of the importance of the, the leadership, really, of small businesses and, and how they can power the economy of the state and, and really um, improve the well-being of, of all Virginians. And leadership takes place at many levels. You need business leadership. You need leadership in the legislature. Um, you've demonstrated extraordinary leadership as governor. How do you think about the leadership of the, of the colleges and universities um, how do you help elevate their role in this work? And, and candidly, how can we at Lumina Foundation do a better job of supporting and elevating them from your perspective? Because our view is that all of the participants in this system must work together to achieve the outcomes, the, the ambitious goals that you've set for yourself as a state. And obviously the college and university leaders play an important role in that. Jamie, you, you are absolutely right. And to, to hit on a couple issues, collaboration uh, is so important, and you know nobody has a monopoly on ideas. And so I have encouraged our our college presidents and their administrations to to work together, especially during times when we you know have some budgetary uh, issues. And so so that's something that we've uh, taken into account. I think the other thing that's important, uh, and you touched on this a little bit, but and that is it, it starts with good leadership. And so to make sure that we have very qualified uh, presidents of our colleges and, and universities that, that have vision, uh, that believe in, in diversity, uh, that is so important. And that also believe in, in, in recruiting talent. Uh, you know, I've always been a believer, talent uh, attracts other talent. And so if we have strong people, strong leaders that have good vision at the top, then other people want to be part of that uh, process. And so we're blessed here in Virginia. I mean, we have great colleges and, and universities, over 150 of them. Uh, but uh, in particular, we have very good leadership uh, at the top in our education system. So that's that's been a real asset for Virginia. Thanks, Governor. So this has been an exceptional conversation for me and I'm sure for our participants. Uh, do you have any concluding uh, thoughts or comments uh, for the participants for for the leaders from around the country who are participating in our state policy retreat about how they might set about uh, doing the kind of work that you've been doing in, in Virginia going forward? 
Well, Jamie, thank you again for the opportunity. And I, I would say, uh, number one, um, it's, it's about teamwork. Uh, it's about collaboration. Uh, it's about uh, all of us working together. Uh, and it's about making education uh, a top priority and also making sure that that access to education is equitable for, for everybody uh, in Virginia. And so I think if people, you know, uh, focus on those concepts, uh, they will continue to move forward. And, and I wanted to thank you again. I, I tried to thank you at the beginning of our conversation, but our relationship with Lumina uh, has just been superb. And, and you know, we, when we talk about raising a child, when we talk about educating a child, Jamie, we, we always like to say it takes a village. Uh, and we're all in this together. So it takes groups like Lumina, it takes folks here at the state level from the private sector. All of us need to be focused on the importance of access to education. And that's what will continue to move us in a positive direction. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, Governor Northam. And like you, we very much appreciate and uh, honor the partnership that we have with you in the state of Virginia. I want to thank you again for joining us for this state policy retreat and thank you in particular for your continuing leadership. It's making a difference. Thank you, Jamie. And to all of you uh, that are listening, stay healthy and stay safe. And we hope to be with you in person soon. Thank you. And welcome to day two of our state policy retreat. Since we were last together last year for our state policy retreat, so much about our world has changed. We're still in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic and continue to reckon with renewed calls for racial justice. We just heard from three governors, Governor Brown, Governor Holcomb and Governor Northam about how they're thinking about racial justice and considering how it will impact the future work of their states. And now we have the opportunity to speak with the three SHIOs from those states about how they too are thinking about how racial justice affects the work that they are doing around credential attainment. So I'd like to introduce our three SHIOs who will serve as our panelists for this session. First, I'd like to welcome Peter Blake, who's the Executive Director of the State Council for Higher Education for Virginia. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Dana. Ben Cannon. Good morning. Ben Cannon, the Executive Director of Oregon's Coordinating Commission for Higher Education. Hi, Ben. Good morning. And finally, Teresa Lubbers, who is the commissioner of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education. Thank you, Teresa. Good morning, Jeanette. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for this conversation this morning, which follows uh, some incredibly powerful statements that we all just heard from your governors about how they are thinking about and really focusing on racial equity as it pertains to the entirety of the work of your states. So I'm excited to have this conversation with each of you today about what this means for the work that you're leading within higher education. And I'd like to start by uh, giving each of you just a few minutes to provide some opening remarks about the efforts that are ongoing in your states to achieve you know, more racial equity as it pertains to both talent development and the work that we're focused on at Lumina, uh, completing high quality credentials. And Peter, I'll start with you. Okay, thanks. And Danette, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to see my friends, Ben and Teresa. And thanks, Jimmy Marisotis for his leadership at Lumina and everyone in the audience today. It's a real honor to follow these three great leaders. And I'm so inspired by, I mean, I know my governor, but I was, really inspired by listening to the other two governors and, and the passion and the commitment that they bring to that. And, and so I think that's a message for all of us that we can take away and apply to our, to our work. 
Um, I'll just mention a couple of things that we have going on in Virginia that are directly related. And, and uh, you may have heard over a year or so ago, we did do a pretty significant financial aid reform. I heard Governor Brown talk about needing, wanting to do that in, in Oregon, whereby more money flows to those uh, institutions that serve more low-income minority students, our HBCUs and some other minority-serving institutions. So we had a significant reform uh, that that led then to, in the 2020 session, the largest increase in need-based financial aid in the Commonwealth. Of course, as you heard Governor Northam said, we had to press pause on that, but um, the commitment was there at the state level. The second, the governor already talked about uh, his appointment of a director of equity and inclusion, uh, Dr. Underwood, who is on this call and is part of our state team. Um, and also then we at CHEV appointed an associate director of, of equity and engagement, Paula Robinson, who's also part of our equity team. So those are a couple of things. And then finally, and then I, I'm thinking back to you know years ago of our conversations, and 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 you got me to, to put on my my uh, my Lumina lens and 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 the equity lens, and we did that very um, intentionally with the governor's development of what he calls the G3 initiative, which is get an education, get a job, and give back, and it's the targeted free community college initiative in Virginia. And as we worked through that last summer because of the way you've directed us and made us think a little bit differently about equity, we looked at every stage of development of that initiative with an equity lens, and I do think it made a difference. So those are a handful of things that, that we have going on in Virginia that I think directly respond to uh, the, the, the type of work that needs to be done. Great, thank you very much, Peter. And we are grateful for the opportunity and been on this journey with you and look forward to what you'll be doing in the state of Virginia. So Ben, I'd like to turn to you next. Uh, we've also had a long uh, partnership with uh, Oregon and your governor delivered an incredibly powerful and pointed message about how you're focusing on racial justice and equity. Can you say a few words about what that means for the way you're approaching your work at the commission? Sure, and let me um, first join Peter in thanking the Lumina Foundation and you, Demet, Danette, for your um, leadership on this. I think um, having helping us to have these important and sometimes difficult conversations and helping to legitimize the work that states, our governors, and that our agencies and commissions are doing with respect to racial justice. I mean, I'll mention a couple of things. The roots of this for the Higher Education Commission in Oregon are deep. We um, really, at the outset of our commission's existence in 2013, adopted a racial equity lens that commits us to applying that, uh, that perspective to policy and budget decisions that we make. And we're still working to sort of live up to the commitment that our commission made at the outset, but it's been reflected in some of the actions we've taken over the years, including, as our governor mentioned, our adoption of a way of funding, allocating funding to our universities that looks at race and ethnicity and, and weights um, outcomes for students of color in the distribution of state funds to our institutions. And there are a number of other steps, but I'll just pick up on one thread um, that the Governor Brown uh, described about our ongoing work and our attempt to really amplify uh, our commitment to uh, communities of color and learners of color. And that is through the Racial Justice Council that she has appointed and it has an education subcommittee with which we are working um, currently to bring forward our uh, policy and budget options for their review and their input and their leadership in advising the governor and the legislature on what to move forward. Because the governor um, noted for too long, um, we've you know, sort of treated uh, communities of color as uh, you know, an afterthought or things, people who come in late in the game um, and uh, provide perspective and I think really building that into the center uh, of our work at the outset is is key to what we're doing now. And so that's a that's an ongoing process that, that we're engaged in. Great. Thank you, Ben. And we'll come back to some of the things you just mentioned about the actions that you've already put in place and are taking. But I first want to turn to Teresa Lovers, who's the commissioner in my home state of Indiana. And I have to say, I was uh, so pleased and um, very grateful for that powerful message that our governor uh, shared about his commitment to racial equity. 
So Teresa, can you share a few words about that and how you're thinking about that in terms of your own work at the commission? Yes, good morning and uh, thank you, Jeanette, and good morning to everyone. I, it's a privilege to be able to talk a little bit about Indiana's equity focus and build on what I think were wise words from the governor. Um, if you look back to 2012, Indiana established our big goal, working with Lumina, as many other states have as well, as 60% of Hoosiers would have a quality credential beyond high school. It was apparent to us then, it is more apparent now, that there's no way that we're going to get to that goal without addressing better the issues related to equity. And so in 2013, we actually passed a resolution that said we would close the achievement gaps uh, uh, by 2025 with that goal. Um, and we set an interim a goal of 2018 of cutting them in half. We, meet, we met the 2018 goal, but we're a long way off from meeting that goal of 2025. So one of the things that we did three years ago is at the commission, we issued our first equity report. I really think it was the first in the nation that actually disaggregated all of our data, our reports, our completion, and our readiness about higher education based on race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, gender, and geography, rural and non-rural. Uh, we just issued the third report, and uh, it's clear uh, that we're making some progress in terms of uh, getting more people to access and complete college, but actually the disappointing thing is that the, the gaps are even wider. Um, so in earlier this year, we adopted our fourth strategic plan at the Commission for Higher Education, and we called out three priorities in that plan. Uh, it's called Reaching Higher in a State of Change. Uh, we passed that before COVID, but the change has actually accelerated the need to address many of these issues. And our three main issues really were uh, outlined in that report around talent uh, and equity and completion. Uh, we acknowledged in that strategic plan that equity has to be inclusive and that all learners deserve the uh, access to quality education and that they need targeted supports if we're going to really improve the numbers. Uh, we also know that equity is, is critical to our state's success. Um, we're changing economy in our state, I'm sure like Virginia and Oregon. Uh, and if we're gonna get to that 60% goal, we must do a better job to close equity gaps. Um, for over a decade in Indiana, we've had a performance funding formula that called out uh, placing a higher premium on low-income students. And for this upcoming session, we're going to increase that equity premium by 25% to help us meet those goals. And I, um, equity really drove the creation of Indiana's um, early college model program. This was our 30th anniversary to celebrate the 21st Century Scholars Program. Uh, it's proven to be a powerful tool to close achievement gaps and the only population, low income and minority students that are on target to close the achievement gap by 2025. Um, we've, um, some people don't realize that Indiana actually ranks first in the Midwest and fourth in the nation in need-based financial aid and we've sustained that commitment. Of course, COVID has underscored the need to actually look at these inequities in our communities even, even more and with a more uh, obvious intentional focus. Um, like the rest of the nation, we've seen that um, black and brown Hoosiers have suffered disproportionately during this time. A lot of people are talking about a K-shaped recovery, which is not, which will actually show that different parts of the economy and populations are going to recover in different ways. And we're certainly seeing that in Indiana, which accelerates our need. So in the past decade, Indiana has become more racially diverse, more low income, and we have to move with a greater sense of urgency I think it's clear that the governor is leading in this regard with a personal call to make equity priority for the state and his administration. Great, thank you, Teresa. You, you mentioned quite a few uh, strategies and efforts that the state is putting in place uh, to support the governor's commitment to racial equity. And in fact, all of you have uh, shared some specific actions but I'd like to ask, uh, before we move on to some of the ongoing challenges, uh, are there any specific efforts that you started perhaps uh, even before these renewed calls for racial justice and equity that you really wanna lean into or leverage to try to more fully actualize your state's commitment to uh, closing some of these longstanding gaps that we've seen by race? Uh, so do you, each of you want to take a minute to perhaps expound upon uh, some of the opportunities that you're going to be building upon? Then I'll start with you this time. 
Yeah, sure. I'll actually mention um, work that we've begun with support from the Lumina Foundation and our Thai grant. And um, one of the ways that we're using that uh, half million dollar grant that we received from the Lumina Foundation is to uh, put support partnerships between culturally specific community based organizations and colleges and universities. I think higher education for too long has tried to do it alone, right? A lot of well intentioned people at college and university campuses and state officials who are um, working on these issues, but uh, not taking sufficient advantage of the wisdom, understanding and relationships that some of our uh, culturally specific community based organizations have who know the students, know the families, know the uh, know the environment and the setting. And so through uh, through with support from Lumina, and we are making small sub grants to our several colleges and universities to help deepen their partnership with uh, community based organizations to support the success of learners of color, Pacific Islander, Native American, uh, Black, Latinx, Latino, Latino students. And so I think that's just one of a number of efforts, ways in which we're trying to intentionally drive resources um, towards uh, mm -hmm. these students and do so in some ways that uh, expand partnership with a community. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I, I love that focus on partnerships. And you know, that goes back to something that your governor said in her message when she uh, invoked the spirit of one of my uh, champions and heroes, Shirley Chisholm, who was known for saying, you know, if you're not invited to the table, bring your own folding chair. And uh, I think that what you're doing through ensuring that the voices of those that we are trying to serve better are actually a part of the conversation is an example that we all need to continue to follow. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Teresa, I'm going to move to you now. You shared a number of different things that are ongoing at the commission, but is there something that you'd like to uh, speak about a bit more? Well, let me start where both you and Ben were talking about actually engaging with community, faith-based leaders, organizations, at, and at the regional and community level. Uh, I'll talk about a couple programs that we've started here. One is called Padres Estrellas, where we are actually, we, we started this in 2019, and we identified parents in five communities uh, with high Hispanic and Latino populations. We're paying a small stipend for them to actually help us enroll in the early college program, uh, and also to our, our, our next level jobs programs for adults who could come back for more education and training. What we know is that when you're a trusted advisor, someone who knows you, you're more likely to listen to the message and actually step up and take advantage of government programs. Prompted by the success of Padres Estrellas, we are now working um, in a similar way, uh, focused on Black Hoosiers and especially five major urban areas around the state to create ambassadors who will work through community and faith-based organizations um, to better engage with those communities to make sure that we're reaching them and listening first to their voices and finding out what the barriers are, trying to address them. And then I would just mention what I've mentioned before, which is that you know our strategic plan was uh, adopted early this year. Um, it really does call out equity as a major part of that strategic plan. And uh, also I would say the equity report it's, it's great to have this disaggregated data in all of our reports, which we do. It's great to have the special equity report, but it's really used to drive policy and changes, use that data to drive change. And so we've really, um, we're trying to use both our strategic plan and our equity report to actually bring recommendations so that it's not just numbers, but we're actually doing things that change people's lives. That's right. I couldn't have said it better myself, Teresa. Thank you so much for that. Peter, I'm going to move to you now. Is there a specific uh, strategy or action that you had already uh, begun to implement in your state that you're going to double down on as you continue to actualize the racial equity focus? Yeah, thanks, Danette. I'll, I'll just mention two things quickly. One is uh, sort of piggybacks on what uh, Ben and Teresa already said. You know, we can't close the achievement gaps unless we also open the door at the front end more fully. So um, we're also looking at ways to engage uh, communities that we might heretofore not have engaged successfully in the past. So I think I have some things to learn from Teresa and Ben, and I'll be in touch with you to learn to, to figure out better ways that we can work with our college access network and other 
uh, community-based organizations to make sure that more people have greater access to higher education. And the second one I'll mention is just an internal review within our organization, within the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia, and, and taking a very uh, hard look at our, at our values and our ethics and make sure that we're living, we are living out in our work life the the kinds of values that we're now talking about more broadly in our communities. So those are a couple of things that are underway in Virginia that had been underway in, in Virginia and that we, as you said, Danette, need to double down on in the future. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Peter. Um, I guess I'd like to pick up on that point a bit about the work that you're doing uh, inside the organization. And I, I believe that in order to uh, really gain progress on our equity commitments, we have to first begin by being self-reflective and self-aware, and that's how we've tried to approach this work at Lumina. And that means that we sometimes realize that some of the actions that we've taken or some of the well-intended policies that we've supported uh, actually did not have the effect that we thought that they would, or perhaps uh, we've missed the mark or fallen uh, incredibly short in terms of well-serving uh, the key equity populations that we know need to make progress. So I started with um, kind of a, a positive question. I asked you to share some of the successes that you were going to leverage. But now I'd like for you to think back on uh, some of the work that's been happening in your state. And when you think about it now, you say, wow, we really need to do better. We have to remedy that. Um, that well, there was some unintended consequences associated with that. Um, and I'd like for you just to reflect um, on some of those things with the audience. So Teresa, I think I'll start with you. Well, I guess I'm most disappointed that in spite of just good intentions and I think, you know, um, policies and programs that we thought were going to be helpful, we're not closing the equity gaps like we need to in Indiana. And I think that's true across the nation. Uh, I mean, I guess we accept the fact that it's going to take some time and going to have to persist in our efforts to see what we need. But I feel maybe it's because I'm at the close of my career. I feel a greater sense of urgency to be able to, to move. We talk about moving numbers, but we're really talking about, again, changing lives. So I, I think we can celebrate some of our improvements. I would look um, specifically at what's happening in our K-12 system as our pipeline for higher education. And if you look again at the disparity between uh, students of color who are taking AP or dual credit, uh, having the advantages of that, getting the, the highest level of diploma, what we call the academic honors diploma in Indiana, uh, we're, we're, we're not seeing the numbers that we need to. We're not driving those policies. Uh, I would say another disappointment has been that we have not succeeded in, in creating a better pipeline for students of color to become teachers. And we've had, we have minority teacher programs in Indiana, scholarships, um, but um, the reality is that we have too few students who are entering into education and we have too few uh, teachers who have, are black or brown in our schools. So I would say our, you know, while we're making improvements with completion rates, the, the, the disparity still remains. While we're trying to address um, more diversity in our teachers, we don't have it and we have not succeeded. Teresa, thank you for sharing that. You know, you said so much that I think we could spend the next half an hour unpacking some of those uh, things that you've just shared. But the bottom line is that these inequities that we see in educational outcomes are uh, persistent. They are pervasive and longstanding. And I think that's why we have to have some very intentional uh, and deliberate focus to try to dismantle uh, and eradicate them. Uh, ben, I'm going to turn to you now. Yeah, Dana, in your question, you um, noted the importance of self-reflection and organizational reflection mm -hmm. um, as a starting point for doing this work. And I'll, I'll indulge in that for a moment. Um, I, As I reflect back on my roughly 10 years of doing this work, I recognize that there are times where, as a white leader, I have walked into a room of uh, people of color, community leaders of color, um, with the answer or what I thought was the answer and presented it to them as here's what, here's what we think we, here's what we're gonna do to help you. 
when those people have not been meaningfully consulted in the development of that so-called answer. Um, and we've got to do better, right? I, our organization, our commission, our state, in the development of policy, in the development of budget, um, in the development of theories and strategies for change have to more meaningfully and more deeply engage the communities who we purport to be helping in the work from the outset. And, you know, we're making some efforts at that, including ones um, through the support of uh, Lumina and bringing, uh, bringing diverse leaders to the table and helping uh, advise and support us in the co-creation of policies, of investments to support equitable outcomes in post-secondary education and talent development. But I, I really think um, that's a that's a that's a transition that we're trying to make um, fitfully. I think as a state, as a state with a history of um, racial segregation and racial exclusion and racial injustice. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, it's a, both an uncomfortable and an exciting place, uh, to be as a leader. But I think that's, that's really where for us, um, it begins. I joined Teresa, I mean, in, in terms of the challenges that we have yet to really meet, uh, with our work, with our actions, with our policies, the, the our failure yet to close some of the most persistent gaps in post-secondary education and look forward to, um, to talking about those um, in the remaining minutes of, of the panel. So Ben, what I heard you say is that something that you've learned about the way that you're leading this work is that it takes uh, you know, some humility and even some vulnerability, um, which sometimes uh, doesn't necessarily uh, naturally align or maybe instinctually align with uh, the way that some people lead, but I think bringing that to the table and inviting people into the conversations is certainly uh, an important first step to getting some solutions and also some traction uh, on these inequities that we are all trying to resolve. So thank you. Peter? Well, I'm struck by kind of the depth of emotion that Ben just expressed. Um, we, we too have the challenges around the metrics that Teresa described and they bring us some disappointment. And but, you know, my my own disappointment around this might be very personal and whether or not I'm doing the right things at the right time in the right way. And and so I, I like Teresa, I've been doing this for some 30 years. And, um, you know, you ask yourself, am I the right person to lead in these times? And it causes some real reflection on on our our, our personal values and, and how we do our work. And I, I can not say enough about um, at this time, uh, as you said, Danette, being vulnerable and, and then taking a real leap of trust with uh, individuals and people uh, with whom you might not have had that trust in the past. And, and I think that's been um, very valuable and important for me in, in kind of thinking this through. So I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you, um, Peter. So one way of um, expressing vulnerability is I think asking for feedback and what you can do better or differently to help support and facilitate the work. And that's something that we've committed to doing at Lumina. Um, we have an equity first orientation and perspective that's guiding everything that we do but we think that we have to do this work hand in hand with our partners. So a question that I'd like to ask you is, as we go forward and head first with our equity commitment, is there more that we could be doing? Could we be doing things differently to support the efforts that you are implementing in your own states? Peter, I think I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I need to reflect on that a little bit more, Danette, but what you have done in the past as far as um, uh, you know, the, kind of the, some national leadership around these issues has been extremely important and critical in helping in our um, development. So, you know, I want you to keep doing that. Um, as far as anything other specific, um, I'm going to have to pass right now. I need to, I need to think a little bit more, Danette, about, about that question. That's fair. Thank you. Come, Teresa. Come back to me in a minute.
I think you could help us with, and I, I think we maybe reflect a little bit about what can we do in the short term and then and what do we have to have as sort of our north star of where we're going and, and how we're going to measure that. So I think we're all consumed right now with what our institutions are doing for students in, in light of COVID. Um, and so I think what I'm concerned about is as we obviously address those needs, I don't want us to take our eye off of the ball of other things that need to be done. So to the degree that you can continue to elevate these discussions for us, uh, be thought leaders out and provide that kind of backup for us, I think it's, it's very, very important. And then um, I think we need to think about how higher education is going to innovate or through this equity lens. So what is going to look different about the equity discussion when you're talking about um, everything from online education, adults coming back, lifelong learning, uh, you know, all of the things that we know are changing uh, the delivery higher education. So I guess um, what I'm asking is that you come, sometimes you lead, sometimes you come alongside, sometimes you prod, and but that we are partners in this important work together. Noted, thanks, Teresa. Ben, do you have anything to say on this one? Yeah, maybe just a just a thought. Um, you know, one thing I've wondered not just about Lumina, but but all of us too, is whether in this moment we are thinking in sufficiently transformational ways, right? I, and I, I think as a result of the pandemic and how much our world has changed in the last eight months, um, new opportunities have likely arisen too. And so as we look at the ways that our institutions have so quickly adapted to serving students primarily online as we think about the potential for new federal partnership with states and with higher education and as we reckon with um, the our, our increased understanding and urgency around issues of racial justice i wonder whether um, lumina and whether our states and state policy leaders are Look, are, are being sufficiently transformational, right? Whether we are still applying sort of incrementalist tools to a moment that may allow for um, a real sea change in how we uh, structure, deliver um, post-secondary education and training. So uh, that's, a, that's a wondering, not an answer. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's a great, um, point to kind of continue to uh, reflect on and consider. But it leads me to another question that we often get from our colleagues and partners as we work across all 50 states. And it is to your point of really not tinkering around the edges as we try to address the inequities that we see in our state, but really focusing on them um, with intentionality. But we often see, um, as we partner with our colleagues, that there are some who say that they are in states where they can't talk about race. They can't lead with the gaps that exist, even if they share the data um, and the disaggregated data, as you mentioned earlier, Teresa. And I know just from working with your three states that it is, in fact, a journey to being able to get to the place where all of you are now where you can have very candid conversations about the racial inequities that exist, particularly for your Black students, your Latino students, and your American Indian students. So what advice would you have for your fellow SHIOs and for all of those who are doing great work in the state who want to be able to lead on these inequities that exist by race and ethnicity, but are not in a state where those conversations are happening. What would you say to them? This is a question that any one of you can take. I'll jump in. With the discussion about opportunity for all, which I think people do believe. And so, and if you sort of understand someone's life journey, I always, I said when I was in the legislature all those years, if I knew where someone lived and what they did, I understood how they voted. And even if I didn't agree with them, it gave me a place to begin to have a conversation, you know, which I, I think we need to have. I think most people in most states acknowledge that 
um, we need to focus on strong beginnings and then transitions. And so I think that kind of discussion allows us maybe to start to build some bridges. I, I loved the recent work that was done by Education Strategy Group on that, called that From Tails to Heads report. I'm sure all of you have seen it, and hopefully many people on today's call uh, have as well. But, uh, and, I, and I quote, I wrote this down, it said, no one's chances for economic mobility should come down to a coin flip. That there are at least 7,000 high schools where if you're a black, Hispanic, or from a low-income family, your chance of proceeding into a higher, into higher education after high school is less than 50%. A coin flip. We know all too well that it is not actually chance that influence student outcomes, but rather long-standing barriers that limit access and opportunity. I think most Americans agree with that. I think Americans agree that the Hoosiers agree it shouldn't be a coin flip, that everybody should have an opportunity. So I think, I mean, I'm not, I won't be naive so to say that it's not uh, more difficult uh, in some places than others, and that uh, where there isn't diversity, it sometimes is harder to have a conversation about diversity. But I think a conversation about opportunity for all is one that's accepted in most corners of our state. That's right. Thank you, Teresa. And, and you're right, it shouldn't be a coin flip. As I often say, luck is not a strategy. So we have to find ways to get to this very important conversation. Peter, I think you were trying to chime in. Yeah, certainly. And, and Teresa really nailed it on, on the discussion around opportunity. So I give her credit for that. Um, I guess my advice would be uh, not to be afraid of your shadow. I mean, we, the, these are not easy conversations, but wade into it. And, and again, building on that trust that I mentioned earlier, you can have these conversations. These, they're not easy. Um, you know, they're, they, they're troubling sometimes. They, they bring out certain things that perhaps we didn't want to talk about, but, um, you know, fearing them is not going to get us over the hurdle. And again, I think back, Danette, to kind of the encouragement and nudging that you've been giving Virginia over the, over the years, and that has helped us. And, and once we got into it, um, uh, it, it it was far more rewarding than fearful. So um, I, I would say, don't be afraid of your shadow. And we've heard from these three governors that right. come from different states, different regions, different political persuasions, and they all agreed. And that should give us some, some encouragement to move forward with these conversations. That's right. We're good at gently nudging, Peter. So I'm glad that you found that helpful. Ben, do you want to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I can't put it any better than uh, Teresa and Peter. I, th I think that um, mm -hmm. there's there's just, as Peter said, I think we get hung up or we, we become afraid to have the conversation if we're in an environment where we think we're going to be punished for saying the wrong thing. So part of what part of what has to occur even to begin the conversation is the creation of those um, safe spaces. Um, really, you know, good leaders can do that. Um, we have the great fortune um, at the HEC to have recently hired a, a, our first director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, a position created by the legislature last year. I've had the uh, great fortune to work for two governors who have said this is a priority, right, and, and have shown through their own leadership their desire to create the kinds of spaces where we can have these conversations and do this work. And, Finally, I guess, and you know, I think what we've often stressed and what I think we often have learned is that when we create learning spaces that work for our black students, that work for our Latino, Latina, Latinx students and our Native American students, those are learning spaces that work for all students, right? The intentional focus on those students benefits everyone, but those strategies, those uh, having a, a more uh, diverse faculty, for example, is good for all students. And you know, I think there's, a, I don't know if that wins the argument in places where it's difficult or it feels like an argument, um, but it is, uh, at least for me, and, and I think for many Oregonians, a, a pretty compelling uh, point. I would agree, certainly. And you know, at Lumina, we have this equity first uh, focus that is uh, paying a lot of attention, attention to racial equity and justice. 
However, we acknowledge that there are these intersectional aspects of our being that we have to take into consideration as well. So we aren't just our race or ethnicity, but we also have to consider our gender. We have to consider uh, first generation status, parenting status, immigration status. And um, one of the issues of intersection that we are very much focused on at Lumina uh, is adult students and specifically adult students who are also people of color. Now we know that there are 36 million adults with some college but no credential, and we're trying to figure out how to get them over the finish line. So I know that in uh, your state, you have some specific initiatives like the Next Level Jobs Program that uh, Governor Holcomb mentioned that are also focused on uh, serving the needs of adult learners. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to just talk about those efforts because we see them as the fundamental to our uh, work to support uh, racial equity. So uh, Ben, do you wanna start first and then um, Teresa? Yeah, just briefly. So in Oregon, a couple of years ago, we looked at our educational attainment goals and we said, we, you know, we really need to focus specifically on goals for adult learners. And so we uh, took our larger goal of 40, 40, 20 that expresses degree attainment for that express degree attainment ambitions for the overall population. And we disaggregated it by sort of age in a sense. And we established a new goal that by the year 2030, 300,000 Oregonian, adult Oregonians over the age of 24 would earn a credential. Um, and that requires about a 50% increase in the number of uh, credentials that we deliver but over this time period uh, than we would typically expect. So to reach that will require a lot of strategies, among them identifying and elevating institutions that are doing a particularly good job of serving adult students. Um, creating a financial aid approach that is more flexible, that meets adults where they're at, which doesn't, which means that they're not necessarily able to attend full or even half time, um, acknowledging that they have child care, they may have child care and other needs, uh, supporting institutions and becoming um, more adult friendly through more flexible scheduling, et cetera. So those are some of the types of efforts that we have underway. I'm just building on, what, uh, I build on what Ben's saying in terms of the individualization of, of our education and that um, meeting students where they are so that uh, they don't have to adjust to the institutional models, but that we're adjusting our models to them. And this is especially important, of course, for our adult population and for people who have complicated, complicated lives. You know, we've done several things. We started with, you know, working with Lumina, identifying the uh, the you know, 750,000 Hoosiers who had some college but no degree, and we started a program called You Can Go Back, where we provided funding and we provided flexibility on things like if you had met SAP when you left and allowed adults to come back and, and you know, we would forgive what they had done when they were 20 if they were coming back years later. And we brought a lot of people back that way. But it became clear that we had a lot of adults who had no quality credential at all. And so we really started under the umbrella of next level jobs a program called Workforce Ready Grant, where we pay uh, for tuition-free certificates that are in high demand areas. And then we also have an employer training grant, which trains both incumbent and new workers. These programs have been critically important for adults right now with the high levels of unemployment that we've seen with COVID. So I think at the heart of this, it is redesigning a higher education system around the learner. Uh, Danette, I'll just say this is really hard work and to do some of the homework that Ben described ahead of time is really important. Um, we've counted about 800,000 uh, Virginians who have some college and no degree, but then if you start breaking it down and you look at, at the age, uh, how many credits they've had, um, and through our, our longitudinal data system, we're able to compare, we're able to uh, get the wages that they're earning. And so if you put all those together, you can target um, a certain population that's making less than a living wage, who has you know, a, a, a pretty good number of college credits and is still within an age range where you might be able to entice them back. And it's much smaller than $800,000. So do your homework on the front end. And then also second, think about a credential that is of value. 
And so, you know, a bachelor's of interdisciplinary studies, which puts all their credits that they've earned from several different institutions, may not be a credential of value. So you need to, we need to look at, at, at that as well. And um, through that, we've come up and established several years ago, a workforce credential grant program through our community colleges, which is very narrowly targeted on some high demand um, job areas where someone can get a credential less than an associate degree and, and help transform their lives. So as I said at the beginning, this is a really difficult population, but it's a very important one uh, for all of us to meet our attainment goals. And thank you all. Uh, well, our time together has gone by very quickly and we are almost at the end of this session. Um, I'd like for um, each of our panelists to know that I've been monitoring the chat uh, as we've had our discussion and you are getting um, some incredible feedback from our participants uh, about your willingness to engage in this conversation and for uh, the thoughtfulness and candor that you brought to the conversation. And uh, someone said, if if we've ever doubted the power of SHIOs, then this discussion should put an end to that. So I think I'd like to um, end by asking you a question related to that. I've sat in your seats and I would say it's an incredible job and opportunity, but Peter, as you just said, it is really hard work. So as you think about continuing to move forward on the commitments that each of your governors have made, to uh, racial equity, um, what's the one thing that you think you can do as a SHEO to advance that commitment within the work you're doing around credential attainment? What's the one thing as a SHEO that you believe you have the power to do to advance your state's commitment to racial equity and attainment? And whoever would like to take that one first. I'll, I'll jump in just briefly. I hope there are a lot of things that, that I can do. Um, but one thing that I think SHIOs are uniquely positioned to do is speak the truth to power, with power, um, using the data that we have. And in our case, only we have. And, and Teresa um, spoke to this in terms of the reporting work and the equity uh, reporting that, that her agency does. And this is a this is a really important function that we can play is just put it out there and and show it show up show show the data and over and over and over again remind policymakers what's really going on um, in our states. Thank you. I would say that because we're in the unique positions where we have something to say about how we spend money in our states that uh, we need to use our opportunities to talk about paying for what we value as a state. It's how we look at our recommendations that we make to the legislature. So um, I think that's one area where we can make a difference, where we can actually have the dollars being used effectively to be, what I'll close with what, what um, Governor Holcomb said, to be barrier busters to opportunity for all. And Peter, I'll give you the last word as we're out sure. of time. We have the power of convening and also the power of leading conversations. And I think um, if we don't do that now, then when? Well, I just have to say um, thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation and I'm so pleased I've been able to spend this time with you all. But more importantly, I am uh, so encouraged by the work that you're doing and we look forward to being right there beside you as you continue to do great things uh, to make these commitments to equity uh, come to life. So thank you and we look forward to our continued work with you. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Courtney Brown, who's going to facilitate the next session. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, in 2008, when Jamie Marisotis became CEO of Lumina Foundation, he looked at the educational and economic data and realized if the U.S. didn't do something dramatic, we would lack the talent we need to not just thrive, but to survive in the global economy. One of the sources of data Lumina used to make this case was an OECD report that showed that while the U.S. had once been a leader in higher education, the share among 25 to 34-year-olds 
in the U.S. had been rising slower than in other OECD countries in recent decades. And at the same time, the expanding knowledge economy was creating an even greater demand for workers with a post-secondary education, one that would actually require 60% of the U.S. population to have a post-secondary credential by 2025. That's the goal. Since we set that national goal, 44 U.S. states have set their own ambitious post-secondary education attainment goals, and a couple more are on the cusp of doing the same. While attainment is increasing across the U.S. and most states, we still have a ways to go, especially for Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And it's also important to note that these goals are not just about counting credentials, but about ensuring that these credentials are high quality, that they lead to further learning and employment opportunities. We have to ensure that the credentials we're producing are aligned to the labor market. Over the last few years, the OECD embarked on a study of higher education outcomes and labor market relevance. Given the importance of this topic to the U.S. attainment goal, Lumina partnered with the OECD to conduct the study in the U.S. We recognized early on that it would be impossible, or almost impossible, to do just one study, given the vast array of labor markets and higher education systems in the U.S. So we decided to do deep dives into four states. We chose four very different states, geographically, politically, with different higher education systems. And we ended up with Ohio, Texas, Virginia, and Washington. The OECD then conducted a, uh, a, a study with the four states in 2018 to 2019. They did an overview of the U.S. labor market and the higher education context. And additionally, a range of poly policy examples from across OECD jurisdictions. The review was conducted before the global pandemic. And so it was under very different economic circumstances compared to those today. However, I would argue the findings still stand and in fact, may be even more important today. And learning from the findings in this report can provide some solutions to help higher education help more citizens more quickly skill, reskill, and upskill. So I'm joined today to discuss the findings from these studies from representative leaders from across the four states. I have Peter Blake, and I'm gonna start from the east to the west. Peter Blake, director at the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. Sherry Rice, the vice chancellor of higher education workforce alignment at the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Ray Martinez, Deputy Commissioner at Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And Mike Miotti, Executive Director at Washington Student Achievement Council. I wanna thank each of you for your time and talents over this last couple years to do this report. And I'm really excited to dive into some questions about this report. Great. So, Peter, I'm going to turn to you first, if you don't mind. Can you just talk a little bit about why did you decide to participate in this study and why did you think it would be beneficial for Virginia? Yeah, thanks, Courtney, for asking and, and welcome, uh, friends from SHEO. Good to see all of you. Wish we could be together. Um, I think one of the most, well, there are several factors, but I think one of the most um, important ones is OECD's expertise in labor market analysis. And so, as you know, an objective external perspective always can show you some weaknesses and maybe some of your strengths that you didn't know you had, and then perhaps offer some solutions that you might not have thought of. So OECD, as I said, just such experience in analyzing labor market data and looking at some other related data. You know, we get so um, uh, deeply involved in some of our higher ed data that sometimes we don't understand or appreciate the fuller picture. So I think that was one of the greatest values of our engagement with OECD. Plus, of course, to work with and learn from Texas and Washington and Ohio. So those are some of the main reasons that we got involved. Great. Thank you. Ray, building on that a little bit, um, I'd be interested to know what you learned from the process. You participated in the process from a different seat that you're currently in now uh, as deputy commissioner. So 
What did you learn? Um, any big ahas, um, any myth busters or, or anything that just reinforced what you already knew? Yeah, thanks, Courtney. That's that's a great question. And and uh, uh, and, and yeah, I, I, I do have sort of a different perspective. I, I uh, was interviewed uh, by the o OECD staff uh, wearing a different hat back when they were here in the state, uh, you know, talking with different stakeholders here in Texas. At the time, I was president of the Independent Colleges and Universities of Texas, which is a nonprofit association that uh, serves the advocacy uh, interest of uh, 39 private not-for-profit institutions of higher education in the state. So, you know, in, the, in Texas, obviously, like my counterparts uh, from Virginia and Ohio uh, and Washington State, all have diversity uh, in, in their various sectors of higher education. That is definitely true here uh, in the state. And diversity, of course, we define in many different ways. But for, for the state of Texas, we have over 80 community college campuses spread out throughout the state, uh, 37 public four-year institutions, 39 uh, private non-for-profit institutions, as I just explained. So um, so all of that is, any anytime we have an opportunity uh, to gather data and to learn about uh, the the higher education infrastructure, um, I think is very valuable. So I agree with Peter that, that there's great value in uh, the in the in the the uh, the interviews and ultimately the report uh, that was produced by OECD. I think the aha moment, if I can think of one or two, um, would would be the the importance for for texas because we have such diversity in our sector because we have geographic diversity uh and and uh, various institutional missions the aha moment was the importance of the agency to really fulfill its coordinating board function uh and again when i participated in the interviews i was not a part of the agency but i've been working with the coordinating board throughout the last 10, 15 years of my career in higher education. So very familiar with the agency from a different perspective. Now I've been with the agency for the last eight months. There's no question that wearing the hat of an advocate, of an, of an, of an external stakeholder when I did the interviews, I was preaching the same thing that I, that, I, that I think I take away now as one of the deputy commissioners, which is the importance of our agency, of the coordinating board to build meaningful, strategic partnerships. And I think one of the biggest takeaways from the report is the fact that the agency, while plugged in to various uh, aspects or all aspects of higher education, that's always been the case, we really need to be much more strategic uh, and much more deliberate in the relationships that we're building, not just with our primary stakeholders, which are the institutions of higher education across the state, but equally important with other stakeholders, for example, those two or three other state agencies that uh, that work on that 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 deal with workforce education, particularly the Texas Workforce Commission and the Texas Education Agency, which is our K through 12 state agency, we now have much more robust uh, uh, collaboration. In fact, formal collaboration, as is pointed out in the OECD in the OECD report, uh, through our tri agency work group that has been formed by our governor's office, by state leadership, which now has some very deliberate charges and very specific charges that will foster and, and I think encourage meaningful partnerships, not just for our agency with our higher education institutions, but also with employers, with the Workforce Commission, with uh, nonprofit associations uh, that deal with in this workforce education space, et cetera. So the aha moment is one that externally I kind of saw in many of my peers saw it, and we were encouraging the agency to dig deeper and to build more meaningful strategic relationships. I think that certainly is true in reading the report. It's, it's, one, of the, it's one of the things that stands out. And, and you know, our new commissioner of higher education, Dr. Harrison Keller, is very committed throughout his career. That's not an aha moment for him. He saw it as well as an external uh, observer. Now that he's been commissioner for the past year, we're actually emphasizing the importance of digging deeper and building these meaningful strategic partnerships. So uh, I hope that that helps to respond to the question, Courtney. There's a lot that, that comes away from this report, but perhaps that's the most meaningful. Yeah, excellent, thank you. You know, I'm interested, Sherry, in your take. Um, Ohio is very different from Texas, but you sit in this higher education workforce alignment role. Um, so what did you see as, as an aha? 
You know, we, we have a, a program um, called OMIC, Ohio Means Internships and Co-ops, and, and through this report, um, our reviewers really highlighted the fact that that was such a strong program and it was something that we should probably look at to continue in the future. So looking to the OECD report was an opportunity to strengthen and expand partnerships with business and industry and providing internships and co-ops and our apprenticeship opportunities for our students in a statewide effort, especially in work-based learning efforts across Ohio. Working with our other state agency partners, the Jobs and Family Services, the Office of Workforce Transformation, we know we have the will and the interest to make a positive impact. So building a platform from our Work Ready pipeline for today and the future. And with the past successes of the OMIC program, we have a significant foundation which to build upon. So that was one of those reinforcements of, from the report that we got. Through the past several months, our team has reached out to every institution of higher ed to learn how we can continue to be a resource during these challenging times. And part of that outreach has been uh, also including our business partners in those regions. We want to be a resource for our stakeholders. We want to include providing strategies and virtual work-based learning opportunities, and sharing the benefits and the value and add to their business community to continue to build their talent pipeline and how this will support their successful future. So that was an aha moment and a reinforcement at the same time. Great, thank you. So, um, Mike, based on your experience in the study and, and the final report, what recommendations do you have for other states? Um, you know, we were able to do this, this study with four states and have some pretty intensive methodology and, and other pieces, but if other states wanted to do something similar um, to better understand their labor market value and their post-secondary um, uh, system, what recommendations would you have for other states in the audience? Uh, ba basically two is, is number one, you know, I once lived on the other side of the table in some of these conversations. I was a state senator in another state many decades ago. Uh, and so I have a little bit of a, a, a sensitivity to the fact that sometimes we overwhelm the public decision makers with too much information, too much data, too many spreadsheets. So I encourage people to focus on, uh, you know, they're going to have to do all that analysis that we did, but, but to derive out of it the actionable knowledge that fits the attention span of governors, legislators, editorial boards, uh, community leaders, you know, et cetera. And secondly, uh, the report, uh, you know, brought even more attention in our agency and I hopefully in the state, the notion that, you know, broad sweeping population level analyses are helpful at a certain, for certain types of conversations, but for the most point, part, if we wanna really look at how life plays out on the ground, if we wanna look at how life is affecting students of color, whatever, we've got to be able to disaggregate to the level that captures the experience of the, if you will, the people we're trying to help, the students, the future students, society, broadly speaking, and that is best understand, understood on the ground in specific contexts. And we can get the data to better understand that. And so I would encourage other states to be sure, don't just do a broad swipe population analysis, the whole state, dig down, take a look at what's going on for these particularly equity sensitive populations and understand how it varies across different, types of experiences, whether it's geographical or others that, that define lives in your state. Yeah, great, thank you. So I'm interested in, in kind of building off of that, Sherry, because you know this report, as I said earlier, was, was written pre-pandemic in a different, a different time. And so now we have the report. And so one of the questions you know, for each of you is, is now what? Um, you, know, you, you did this report with very different intentions. Um, and now it, it seems even more pressing that we need to, to get started and move on some of these issues. So Ray, I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind. I'd love to hear like, is this study still relevant in Texas? Um, and if so, what are your next steps with it? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's uh, very relevant. Uh, we have a legislative session that is, uh, well, is slated to commence in January. And in Texas, we, our legislature meets once every two years. So they're pretty high stakes. Uh, 140 days of, of our state legislature and our state leadership uh, meeting uh, during that time period. So, um, so it's relevant both timing wise, but also the substance of the report, um, I think is certainly uh, very relevant. Um, it, you know, what we, what we know, so much of our focus, particularly with having, Mike having come in in the past eight months, 
uh, has been the importance of uh, enhancing our workforce education offerings in the state of Texas. And I think for all of us, perhaps, uh, pre-pandemic workforce education and, the, and those uh, high value credentials probably looked different pre-pandemic than they look today. And that's one of the things that we're really focused on here in the state of Texas. Uh, we were allocated, I think every state was getting some of these gear funds, the, uh, the governor's uh, um, education emergency uh, relief, Act, some of the CARE Act funds, in other words. And for Texas, we received about $307 million in gear funds. And in July, our governor uh, announced that $175 million of those gear funds were going towards post-secondary education. So Commissioner Keller, uh, we got together as a staff with his vision to figure out, along with consultation with our state leadership, what, how, is this, how are these funds gonna be used? And in the end, without going into too much detail, 150 million of that 175 that was allocated towards post-secondary education is going in the form of direct grant aid to students in various capacities. But one of the big buckets of that 150 million is 46.5 million that's gonna go towards reskilling and upskilling workforce uh, stu students who are looking to, to get back into a workforce education program. And, and one of the challenges that we have is to identify what are the high value short-term credentials, particularly today uh, in, a, in a pandemic environment, which is different, we know, than it was uh, eight months ago, for example. And then the other challenge for Texas is the capacity. We know that we have 80 plus community college campuses, which are the, the that offer the bulk of our workforce education throughout the state. But looking at the data, we know that seven or eight of our largely urban community colleges offer 70 to 80% of our workforce education credentials. So what about those Texans that live outside of these uh, metropolitan urban areas? We need to increase capacity. And that's one of the things that we're talking to our community college leaders about, the association that represents community colleges. How do we use some of this gear funds? And I think it speaks to the, to the recommendations that came out of the OER report, one of which was not strategic coordination, but it was also about how to, how to strategically use funding to meet some of the goals. And so we have to think about how can we, how can we use some of this funding to incentivize not just high value credential programs, but to incentivize capacity building uh, for our community colleges. So that's, that's more detail than perhaps you want, but it, it, it's an example of, of how this report has been relevant, both pre-pandemic and also relevant in informing our decision-making in a pandemic environment. So tell me, do you think the study is still relevant and what are your next steps in Washington? Well, I think it's even more relevant. Uh, and I think one of the things we have to understand about the effects of the pandemic in so many areas of life, and especially education, is it is most likely to accelerate things that were going on before. And so I think in this area, we what this report was responding to, uh, in part, uh, an increasing uh, focus by the public, uh, meaning potential students, uh, actual current students, uh, employers, et cetera, on the, the value proposition of specific programs in terms of how it sets people up for their life goals, especially jobs and earnings and you know, that kind of thing. We think the, the epidemic is just is going to put is putting that issue uh, on steroids. I think people are going to be much, much more focused on this. And the report uh, the report deals with that. But it also drives us in this new world uh, to realize that that value proposition for the public may best play out in programs that help people move from one sector of the labor market, likely retail, hospitality, food service, to another one that has uh, better pay, better career opportunities, but they need something to begin the transition over and it can't be a four-year degree that takes them seven years to get. We have to figure out how to make these cross-sector pathways work more efficiently for people to solve their needs. Peter, I'd love to turn to you now and, and hear your, your no, now what um, answer. So again, this study was done in pre-pandemic world. Um, is it still relevant in Virginia? And what are your next steps? Yeah, certainly it's still relevant. Um, I think the relevance of the report transcends the pandemic. Let me go back real quickly to something Ray said. Uh, I was struck by the meaningful strategic partnerships that he described. And just part of the process of working with OECD required us to go out and engage 
certain stakeholder groups in ways that you know we thought we knew how to do and and while we do okay there's always more we can do and and so i applaud oecd and setting up a structure that directed us to um, do some outreach in different ways and different groups and and i think that was beneficial to us and to all of our planning so uh, i just wanted to go back and and comment on on ray's um, way of characterizing those partnerships but as far as uh, the pandemic and the relevance still today, uh, I think if nothing else, we need even stronger articulation between higher education and the labor market. And of course, the pandemic is, has upset the labor market in many ways, and we are going to emerge from it with a different economy than we had before. So I think uh, we need uh, the kind of assessment and thinking um, along these lines today more perhaps than we needed in February and March. Um, we in Virginia are in the midst of revisions to the Virginia plan for higher education, which is the statewide strategic plan that all of all of you have. And at the same time, so so this will inform that we also have a couple of, of initiatives that were nascent and now are taking even greater form and what came out of OECD will help us. Uh, one is a multi level multi agency effort to better align the curricula and the programs that we have at our colleges and universities with labor market needs and so trying to come up with a, a more objective and neutral body that can can report on the direction uh, where we need to go in certain areas and then working very closely on our academic side and the programs and curricula to make sure that they're better aligned so this fit perfectly with that we also have a maybe a, a one in the nation study graduate outcome study that we're doing right now to look back at graduates over the last 10 years and particularly what they took away and how relevant their education was to their future life, not just in employment, of course, but, but in other areas of their life. So that's a second area that this study has informed. And then a third is around, I think, uh, Sherry mentioned an internship program in Ohio. And so we have uh, a new program that was created in 2018. So the timing of having this study and the results and the recommendations with um, how we roll out that internship program is, is particularly useful. So. I think it's relevant today, maybe even more so than it was in February and March. Excellent. Sherry, to you, um, a same question. You know, our, our, uh, we've been focused on so many other things since the pandemic. And so how, how is this report still relevant if it is? And what are your next steps with it? Yeah, the report's more relevant than ever. Um, and, it, and it's the timeliness of it all. You know, we look at statewide policy and the initiatives that we had moving forward. Um, and one is being on resource management for our institutions and making sure that we as, an, as a state and we as an agency, coordinating agency, are providing the, the adequate and the necessary resources across to all of our entities as much as possible. One of the things that came out of uh, COVID-19 experience, um, which moved, some policy initiatives way up the charts is our issues around broadband access across the state and looking at it from the standpoint of how education is being delivered. And that's post-secondary and education as a whole. So looking at it from the standpoint of how can we as a state of Ohio improve or strengthen the statewide broadband access and expand the resources for education and training as we move, or I should say, dive into a blended educational and training environment. Um, with statewide initiatives, with Innovate Ohio, Lieutenant Governor's Office, et cetera, ODHE and other entities, we have a goal to improve that access, promote reduced inequities in education and training, and strengthen the ability to offer an opportunity for growth and innovation through statewide entrepreneurship. We also have, you know, looking at partners across that we already have, like Lumina, and um, National Governors Association, strengthening those partnerships as well as looking at those resources and the best practices that we can glean from that information. Um, one of the opportunities with the National Governors Association, we're embarking upon a post-secondary survey on broadband access. And Peter and I were having a conversation before today and talking about you may have broadband access, but do you have the devices to be able to perform this education and training uh, flow? So our goal is to, and I loved your your verbiage, and one of the questions is myth busters. We're going to use this survey to bust through the myths of where we believe we have those gaps in broadband access and 
have an opportunity to really uh, identify those gaps in service and for a stronger infrastructure across the state. This, this study helped put that in front of us, but then it really put it in front of us and moved those initiatives up our priority in our strategic planning process. And we're very much looking forward to the survey results and acting upon those findings, not just find out what those findings are, but acting on those findings. And then lastly, something that um, we talked about is upskilling and reskilling of our education and training opportunities. Um, one of the efforts that the state of Ohio had put into place, and again, this policy really reinforced the need to support um, that retraining, that reskilling, and in, in particular, our incumbent workers and our, our adult learners. So state of Ohio uh, put in place a program called TechCred, where we help actually reimburse companies for putting individuals through a upskilling or a reskilling process um, and help the employers be able to continue to build their infrastructure and their growth opportunities, as well as building a, a needed talent pipeline for their future. So yes, the report's still very relevant and we're thankful to be a part of it. Excellent. So one, one last question for, for each of you. I'm, you know, we have an incredible audience right now of state policy stakeholders, uh, and uh, they didn't all get to participate in, in this study. Um, and, you know, hopefully many of them will be able to read it. But what is something if you said, here's the one takeaway, this is what I want the audience to know about this report that they could use or, or be aware of. Sherry, I'll start with you. What do, what do you think is that one important takeaway? Keep your eye out for best practices in other states. I think the opportunity to work with Virginia, Washington, just having this opportunity to be able to work with all four states and um, learning from each other, even though we may be unique in some of the offerings that we do and the policies that we put forth, but learning those opportunities from the other three states are just significant. So keeping an eye open to best practices across the other states and follow the strategies that are being implemented to support the future of education and the future of work. Um, resources, like I said, Lumina, OECD, SHEO Work, National Governor Association. You have so many resources that you put in front of us all the time. Take the time to actually dive into those resources about best practices. Um, and, and, and have the opportunity to learn from those best practices and use them to achieve your economic growth opportunities and strong education policy moving forward. So yes, keep an eye on all those best practices. Um, Ray, I'd like to ask you also, if you could think about one thing um, from this process, from either the, the seat you sat in before or where you are now, and you know, implications or next steps that you, you think would be important, what, what do you want the audience to take away? What would be one thing from this report that's important. I think among other things, the report is really, uh, Courtney, uh, just a stark reminder that higher education, you know, irrespective of what state you live in, uh, higher education is complex, it's constantly moving target, and it requires a very timely and sort of multifaceted coordination and, and approach by all stakeholders. But that's particularly true of an agency like the one I work at, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Needless to say, not only across the U.S., but as I've already mentioned here in Texas, there is vast diversity in our higher education infrastructure. Um, and because of this great, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this large amount of variation, the, the need is even more imperative, quite frankly, for a strategic approach. And I think the, the, you know, the, the implications of, of, this, of this report are not just in the data that's been collected and, and amplified back to us as state policymakers, but it is in the fact that there's also been, uh, you know, a strategy that's put forward, a policy uh, framework, if you will, uh, to for better coordination, uh, for, for for strategic funding. You know, uh, I, my recollection from one of the the, the report's uh, uh, goals or policy recommendations was also to you know to increase not just educational offerings, but student supports and pathways, and that's another way that this report has informed us. We're actually doing very deliberate, very strategic conversations among stakeholders on how to increase transfer pathways, academic transfer pathways in particular between our two-year institutions and our public four-year institutions. So again, 
there's a lot that can be said that is sort of takeaway, very productive takeaways from a report like this. But it, but but overall, I think the most important thing is we have a, a really sound blueprint and really sound data that helps inform our state agency as we're gearing up for an important state state legislative session. Uh, there, 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 to me, uh, that's exactly what we need is to be informed as we're getting ready for what will be a high stakes legislative session here in Texas. Yeah, I think the report really brought to life in, in Washington and for me, the challenge that has been sort of seeping up out of everything that's been going on for a number of years. And, and that is that we really have got to embrace the notion that education is a long-term pathway for the people who travel down, for the students and others who travel down that pathway. Uh, that's the way they see it, right? And the different pieces of that pathway, the different programs, the different schools, whatever it is, and I'm talking about everything from you know, or even early childhood education through K-12, through through whatever you do in post-secondary and whenever you take it. That is a long-term pathway that you need to successfully navigate to have success. We, on the other hand, in the education world, tend to be focused on our program, our institution, our piece of the pathway, right? And that type of thinking in which we are an island and we build certain models of how you get to be on our island, and how you get to be successfully off of our island or unsuccessfully off our island. All of those behaviors that focus on our world, our island, and not on the students' pathways sets us up for many of the failures that we're trying to turn around, and especially failures in terms of serving first gen and students of color and underserved populations. Thanks. Peter, what would you say? Courtney, I'll go back to where I started, kind of the rich, the richness of the data analysis that OECD brings to this. I mean, it was a fascinating process to watch them come to our state, meet with people, dig through our data, and then how they synthesized it and put it together and combined it with other data, that, again, that we don't routinely review. So that I would call attention to chapter two in particular, and this is where uh, they compare the alignment of higher education and the labor market. And they use some, as I said, some of the traditional data that we use in looking at higher education, but combine it with things like GDP per capita, employment rate, annual median earnings, population, uh, certain kinds of trends and other demographic features. And just so I, I would uh, encourage other states to look at some other data points and combine it with what we already have and, and then use that to inform many of your decision processes as we are now with our statewide strategic plan and some of the initiatives that we have other, uh, underway that I mentioned. And then finally, I'll just go back again to the strategic partnerships that Ray mentioned early on. Um, use uh, these opportunities to engage your business community and your academic leaders on a topic uh, that maybe you've had the conversations before, but now you might want to have them differently given the, the, the COVID era in which we live um, and and just again, kind of mixing the richness of the data with the with the urgency of of the need and and um, putting it all together in some ways that fit within your strategic planning within your state. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Peter. And um, you know, I, I think you're right. In some ways, the report is is almost a blueprint that other states could could use um, and and do some of the same things, follow the same methodology that OECD used. So I. I like, um, I think that's an important component. So I just want to end by by thanking each of you um, for your time and talents throughout this process. This was not an easy ask. Um, this required uh, opening up your calendars, your networks. Um, I appreciate your staffs and your colleagues for an incredible amount of time over this almost two year process that that got us to this point. Um, so again, thank you, and and I do hope that. Others will go and look at this report. Um, and I think there are a lot of incredible takeaways for, for every state out there. So again, thank you so much to, to each of you. I appreciate you. Hello again. It's bittersweet to deliver the news that you've made it to the end of our public programming of Lumina's state policy retreat. Dr. Howard and our esteemed panel of state leaders, we're grateful you spent time with us, sharing how to move from reaction to action, putting equity first on the agenda in state. 
Dr. Brown, our partners at OECD in, o in Ohio, Texas, Washington, and Virginia, remind us of the persistent value of credential attainment for the individual and state economies. We've had a rich discussion about how states are driving toward their state attainment goals. Courtney mentioned that 44 states have adopted a goal and a few are on the cusp. Well, I'm thrilled to share that moments ago, Mississippi became the 45th state to adopt a state attainment goal by unanimous support of the Mississippi Education Achievement Council. Congrats to our friends in Mississippi. If you're a part of state team, we have more compelling content ahead for you, including another workshop and team planning time. We'll take a brief break and meet back in the sessions tab of the conference platform for our workshop entitled Getting People Back to Work Through Equity-Centered Agendas and Credentialing. We can't say goodbye until we've offered our thanks to the Lumina team who made this possible, especially Danette, Scott, Paola, Domi, Molly, and Michelle. To all of our participants in yesterday's and today's sessions, let this not be the end of our connection with you, but the start of a powerful partnership. Thank you for joining us on our shared journey of achieving equitable attainment for today's learners.